Are secret love letters really anonymous? This is the University of the Netherlands. You might remember the Unabomber case from over 20 years ago. Is there anyone who remembers? If you don't, I tell you something about it. Una Bomber was the name given to an unknown terrorist in the United States who was perpetrating terrorist attacks in the 80s and the 90s based on political reasons. Now, in 1995, he sent his manifesto to a couple of newspapers, including the Washington Post, and after debating a bit, they decided to publish it. Now, it went out, and then someone read it and thought, oh, Oh, this sounds a lot like my brother. And it actually was his brother. So this was the initial seed that started the police investigation into the right direction. How did that happen? Well, when we write, there is something, there is some trace that we leave. There is some sort of fingerprint in the way that we write, in the way we choose our words, in the way that we structure our sentences, there's something about us in what we write. So I'm going to do a little test with you. I'm not going to pick any specific volunteers. I will just want every one of you to participate. And I'm going to show you some tweets. And I will ask you not to tell me who wrote them. That's going to be a little tricky. I'm just going to tell you to ask you to tell me the gender of who wrote these tweets. Okay, are you ready for that? This is the first one. So how many of you think this is a male tweet? Well, you guys are wrong, because this is a female tweet. Now, let's try again, let's see the next one. So is this a male or a female? How many males? There you go, well done, this is a male. Now let's try another one. Please tell me how many of you think this is a female? Ha, huh. no, this is actually a male. And we'll see another one. I know, so how many of you think this is a female? Everyone thinks so. This is actually a male who wrote this. And we have two more. How about this? How many of you think is a male? Not many, right? You're right, this is a female. And we have one left. How many males? <laughs> right, you go for the Nintendo Switch? <laughs> it is a male. What happened is that in order to answer this, you sort of relied on some very classical stereotypes. And don't worry, we all do this, you're not alone. There are studies exactly in this task that show that people tend to rely a lot, even more than is actually granted by the data, on such classical stereotypes. Now I have another question for you. Do you think that a computer would be better at this than what you did? Yeah, some nodding, some not. Well, why do I ask you this? Because I work on this. I am a computational linguist. That is that I use computers to process and understand human language, like how it works and how it's used in society. But I also work towards making processing applications, like language applications in language technology, and more specifically, I do train machines to learn something from what people write. And this is called author profiling. Now, how does it work? So what we have to do to do this is that we have to take some evidence. Like we take, for example, text that is written by someone or tweets that are written by someone. More is better than one. And then we represent these tweets, this text, as something, like, for example, the words that are used, the way punctuation is used, and so on. Then we associate this to the actual answer, like, is this really a female or a male? And we pass all this to the machine. 
And through some learning algorithm, we build a model. Now, this model will be able to tell us, given a new tweet, if who wrote it is a male or a female. What you see now on the screen, it's actually a model. And it's a word-based model. And it takes single words, but also sequences of words. Now, what you see on the left and in the top left, it's words that are frequently used by males, and in the bottom right is words that are frequently used by females, as learned from the data. If we zoom in a little bit, what you see up there, do I have to comment on that? Probably not. We can also zoom in on the female words and see what actually appears there. <laughs> now, how stereotypical is this? A lot. And this could be the words that have also guided you in telling me earlier, oh yeah, this was written by a male, this was written by a female. This is also something that the machine has learned. But hey, the machine has also learned something else because it had looked at a lot and a lot and a lot of data and doesn't necessarily rely on such stereotypes. So if we look more carefully, what we can see is that there's something there that apparently is typical of males. Like it's, I'm, not really. If you had seen that in a tweet before, would it have been a clue for you to say, oh, it's a male? No. Unless you know now, maybe. But in the same way, we can see that apparently females use as if and to eat more than males. Well, the machine learned this, and you would not be able to just tell it out of your head because that's not really a stereotype, but that apparently is something that people do. And why do they do that? Well, because we make a lot of unconscious choices. We don't actually always think of what we're writing and how we're writing. A lot of our choices are not conscious at all. And talking about choices, do you know that actually the way that you write your emoticons can say something about your age? So if you want to look young uh, and cool, you better never use the nose. <laughs> because that makes you old. So actually, I found out that emoticon-wise, I'm young. So that's good. So why then so machines do this a lot better? Because of trying to get these unconscious choices that are so hidden in our writing. And they do it, really, with a performance which is above 80%. Now, do they do it better than people? People can do it pretty well, too. But the same tweets will not be identified in the same way by machines and humans. If machines do 80% and people do 80%, it's going to be different 80% because maybe people are better when the stereotypes are involved, but machines are better when some hidden clues are involved. Also, I have been a bit mean with you because I've only shown you one tweet. So I could actually make it a lot easier for you uh, to tell me the gender if I show you pictures. I think it's quite straightforward for you to tell me what gender these people are, and also some sort of ballpark of their age. But I'm going to be mean again and ask you, can you tell me what language they speak? Dutch. Dutch. <laughs> no, they don't speak Dutch. They speak different languages. Now, it might be easier if I show you some text that they have written. Now, if you see this, can you tell what language is this? Italian, thank you very much. So this is the language that was spoken by the guy on the left. What about this? Do you know what language this is? It's beautiful, yes. This is Telugu, which is a language which is spoken in some regions of Southeast India by over 80 million people. Now, if you see this, you might not know exactly what language it is, but it gets kind of closer, 
right? I make it even harder now for you and ask you if you can tell me. So these are pieces written by these people in English. So English is not their native language. So you'll see mistakes there because it's not their native language. But if we just see the English, which is their second language, can you tell me what their native language is? Now, this is getting really hard. Now, I can tell you because it's the same people as before. So the top one is Italian, and the second one is a Telugu-speaking person. But it's very, very hard to tell for people. However, we do train machines to do this. And how does it work? Well, very similarly as before, machines see a lot of evidence of texts written in English by non-native speakers of English. And what do they capture? They capture some patterns. And what are these patterns? Well, you have to assume that if you are a non-native speaker of English, you might make similar mistakes in English as people who speak your own native language. Like you, native speakers of Dutch, actually will make mistakes similar to other speakers of Dutch and probably different than speakers of, say, Russian or Italians. And machines are really, really good at capturing this. Now, we thought, actually, that one clue we could give machines, for example, was sentence length. Because as an Italian, when I was learning English, I was always told, oh, no, 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 you have to make your sentences shorter and shorter and shorter, because in Italian, we tend to write really long sentences and this and this and this happened, and in English, you have to write them short. So we thought, if we consider sentence length, this might be a very good indicator. It turned out that actually the best indicator you can give a machine is just sequences of characters. And then the machines will be able to pick up on all possible mistakes and patterns that it's in this data. Do you know how well, actually, machines can do this? So we train machines to distinguish among 11 different languages. And there you go. It's 85% accuracy in distinguishing this. So these are really good. Now you might wonder, well, where does it stop? <laughs> What else can you tell about me if you see my writing? If you just pass my writing to a machine, what else can it tell me? Well, there's a lot of work in our field to predict personality from your writing. And it also works quite well. And in very recent work, we've also researched how to glean information about the socioeconomic status of writers. And we did this by exploiting reviews online about different ranges of restaurant. Very low end, very high end, and then we associate the reviews to that, and then we try to discover what stylistic patterns characterize certain people who visit certain restaurants and other people who visit other kinds of restaurants. Does this worry you? <laughs> A little bit. I can see this. Let me tell you why we do it. So as an academic, what I'm really interested in is understanding writing as a very special human trait. There are no other animals that write. So what I want to find out is how much of us is really encapsulating in the way that we write. And I think this is an extremely fascinating question. But on top of that, of course, we also make applications, as I said. Now, how many of you do not use Google Translate? <laughs> There. I guess we can say that the majority does. Now, if I want to translate something from English into Italian, like I, me, myself, I want to translate something, let's say that I want to say, I'm glad to be here. The translation that Google tells me is, sono contento di essere qui. That's wrong. Because as an Italian, I'm not contento, I am contenta, because I'm a woman. Now, if we can get out of writing, actually, the gender of the person who's writing, of course, we can improve also 
very basic translation systems. And on top of that, of course, you can see how this kind of technology comes handy if you want to, say, uncover some writer writing under a pseudonym. I don't know how many of you have heard about the Elena Ferrante books. It was a big success, but Elena Ferrante does not exist. It's a pseudonym, and there has been a lot of work trying to find out actually who she was. Turns out, could be a man. Do you know about J.K. Rowling? Harry Potter? Well, she also wrote this book. There's no Robert, there's J.K. And do you know that there's also work aimed at finding out who actually wrote the Dutch national anthem, which is the oldest national anthem in the whole world? So there's study, there's some research on it, because it's not so obvious who wrote it. And now there's even an international competition among research teams trying, yes, trying to find out who the real author of the Dutch national anthem is. And obviously, you can see how this kind of technology comes in handy to help, for example, police research cases like the Una Bomber case that we talked about. Because we had a question at the beginning, <laughs> I want to just get back to that and ask you, do you think that if you write a secret love letter, can it stay really anonymous? I think it's only up to a point, <laughs> because there is so much that we leave trace about in our writing that we don't even notice, like the as if or to eat, or little patterns that we leave around that they say something about who we are, that there is really a lot of information about the author that can be gathered from the text that this person has written. So always remember that there are not just words in text, but there is a lot of you. Thank you. Thank you.